Welcome back. And we're moving into our first conversation this morning, talking about mental health first aid. We have with us on set professional counselor, Amy Jackson. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. And I think this is definitely very useful information for the wider public because while we have general conversations about mental health, uh, oftentimes we, the general public, don't know how to identify uh, when something is wrong. One of the main things that I have trouble with a lot of clients with getting them in the door is that people think counseling is for people who have schizophrenia, who are in a manic episode, people who cannot leave their house because of depression, you know, something major. And it's important for us to start identifying these little red flags as we go along so that we don't get to that point. Mm -hmm. Having that early intervention is very, very important. Yeah. So what would you say is the preferred time a person should seek out the assistance of a mental health professional? There is no timing that is perfect. It yeah. depends on the needs of the person and some people might need earlier in intervention than others. Mm -hmm. It depends on the coping skills the person has. It depends on the social support that the person has. Yeah. And it also depends on if the person is willing. Sometimes you push people into therapy and you tell them a lot of things, mm -hmm. but if they're not willing to listen, maybe you got a little bit in. Yeah. One of the first things I remember from school, one of my professors told me, use every single appointment, every session as your first and your last. Mm -hmm. Make sure that in that intervention you covered enough to help the person cope with the problem. Yeah, because sometimes they go in by force and they don't come back. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the signs that uh, people can look out for. And we're, we're really going in different areas. You're talking about within the workplace, you're talking about uh, within schools and also within your family. In general, you want to notice not necessarily big changes, but things that you see different. Mm -hmm. As someone's teacher, as someone's employer, as someone's employee, as a parent, as a child, you want to notice changes. Mm -hmm. That's the major thing. How is the person interacting? Is mm -hmm. the person avoiding something? Is the person doing something more specific? You know, so you want to notice changes in the person. Changes in eating and changes in sleeping are very big indicators that you can always watch out for. Yeah. And changes as in uh, you eat too much or you eat or you don't eat at all? Yes, it yeah. can go either way. Um, mm -hmm. Some parents will look back and say, you know what, my child was like very good all summer, but as soon as school started, like he stopped eating completely. And this is a 13 year old boy who stopped eating, like, <laughs> you yeah. know? So you want to make sure that you notice those little things yeah. because sometimes you don't realize, um, especially in high school when you don't go home for lunch or, or things like that, um, people stop eating at lunchtime. Mm -hmm. um, even if you go to work, if you work in a professional setting and you work from eight to five and you have your one hour lunch break, people might not notice because maybe yeah. you eat on your own, but you stop eating, you stop going out for lunch, you stop interacting with your peers. So you want to notice any withdrawal from the regular activities. You want to notice any changes in eating or sleeping. Mm -hmm. um, behavioral changes, is the person's mood different? Does the person have mood swings? Is the person more irrational, more angry, more like with a shorter temper? Or is that person a lot more placid? You know, you have people with very strong personalities who all of a sudden just are going with the flow. Yeah, who get very non-reactive. Mm -hmm. yeah. So once you see something that is outside of the norm of what you expect from another person, mm -hmm. um, that's one, one thing you can look at. Now, how do you know if it's, I mean, they could have just had a really bad night. They could maybe be, have some financial problems and stress mm -hmm. or a fight with their spouse or child at home. How do you know when it's more than just a bad day or a bad night the day before? When it starts affecting you on a regular basis, if you had a bad day, we understand that. If you had a bad couple of days, like three days of the week, you were really bad. Mm -hmm. But 
if you're working and your productivity decreases mm -hmm. or your grades change, mm -hmm. let's say you are a regular B student and all of a sudden you just can't bring yourself to make a 70, mm -hmm. you know, those are the kinds of changes that you're looking for. Yeah. Even though things may be regular, you're underproductive. You're yeah. not your normal self. Yeah. Um, those are a main indicator that you can look for in other people. And one of the things I want to say is that when you notice that in yourself, it's important to sit back and recognize why you are underperforming. Mm -hmm. A lot of people will push themselves a lot more and say, I know I can do it. My regular is an 85 or a 90. Mm -hmm. Why am I not getting that? Why can't I do it right now? Mm -hmm. And so they judge themselves. They put a lot of guilt on themselves. And very often these kinds of things lead internally to those avoidance, the changes in sleep habits and so on. Yeah. And it could even lead to self-injury or thoughts of suicide. Yeah. So when we look at the change in behaviors, that's, that's one red flag that we're talking about. Are there any other physical signs that one may ma manifest, something about appearance that may change or? One of the major things that I, I discuss too is sometimes people will just change their appearance. Mm -hmm. Some people who are very involved in how they look, maybe you see one of your co-workers who changes their manicure like every two weeks, all of a sudden a whole month has gone by and they have the same one. And you know, those are little things that are a big deal to people and, and you don't realize. Yeah. Um, sometimes in men, they, they don't take care of their shoes anymore. You know, it's the little things that you don't notice. One of the things that um, I, I like to say also is in multiple sectors, how their behavior is changing. Maybe at work they are isolating, mm -hmm. but then if they have kids at home, because mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times we don't look at the parents. We always say, parents look out for these signs in your kids, yeah. but we don't look at it in our partners, in our family members, in the adults in our home. Let's say you come home from work and you had a challenging day at work, mm -hmm. and then you get home and you just don't want to deal with the kids and you go directly just you make whatever meal you have to and you shut yourself down in your room yeah and and uh -huh. i was i was going to ask him about that because we do know uh and i've heard of, of of cases of persons who suffer with depression and to the rest of the world it's totally normal but it's the behavior when they get home the locking up in mm -hmm. the room closing the curtains at midday and wanting to sleep Yes. to just get away from life. Yes, and yeah. doing that repeatedly. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's very scary. One of the things that you have to make sure is that these people are affected in more than one area. Yeah. Like I said, it's affecting your productivity at work, but also your house hasn't been cleaned for a while. You know, it gets dusty and yeah. people don't realize that because we don't um, go into people's homes very often. Yeah. Um, so you might be taking care of yourself, your hair is clean, you smell okay, your clothes are still pressed, but on your bed there's a big pile of clothes that, mm -hmm. you know, eventually it just piles up there. And um, so we have mm -hmm. to look out for these kind of hoarding behaviors. Maybe it carries over after a while to your office, to your classroom. Yeah and things like that. So what you're saying is it's going to show in some aspect of your life, whether at home or at work. Are there also, I mean, like weight loss, hair loss or weight gain and... This, why, this is why it's important to start noticing those sleeping and eating habits. One of the things I always tell people, if you're not sleeping, we can't tell what's wrong yeah. because the sleep will be covering up everything. If you don't sleep for long enough, you might become delusional, you know? <laughs> if you don't sleep long enough, your mood will change. Mm -hmm. um, you become irritable. At some point last night, I just started like <laughs> getting really upset because I was tired. Yeah. And so these kinds of things happen and it's important to start noticing it in the beginning. It can get to the point where your grooming habits change, where you become the stinky person in the office, mm -hmm. where your nails and, and your um, Like you're appearance. just disheveled. Yes. yes. It can get to that point. But again, that would be a more severe thing. Yeah. Just those red flags, you're looking at withdrawal, mm -hmm. changes in functioning, maybe becoming a little bit more sensitive, like a 
this interest in activities that you usually like to do um, feeling like you're not a part of anything and this is something that happens a lot they stop going to church they stop going to their group meetings they stop going out for happy hour mm -hmm. um, on the other hand if they want to get away from home they're going out every Thursday every Friday every Saturday yeah. they find an event to do every single day um, unusual behaviors for that person and primarily mood changes mm -hmm. now <clears throat> mental illness can can manifest in many different ways and I know you know we try we talk about anxiety and we talk about uh, depression and there are some other more serious uh, or I guess what I want to say is there there's some that manifest in a way that we really that really makes us uncomfortable like yes. schizophrenia for example mm -hmm. or uh, other behaviors that are just completely out of the normal uh, classification that we expect from people mm -hmm. what happens when you start to see these signs and what really what really I mean I hate using the word normal in this conversation but what really classifies as out of context well this is why these are called mental health disorders yeah because when you are in order it's not perceptible yeah, true. right I've had a couple of clients who have had schizophrenia for years and no one knew because they had normal functioning at work I mean mm. they could interact with peers um, I had this one person who heard voices all day and all night long but he had a job he had a girlfriend he had his home, it's just in the night, he just would need substances to relax and to shut the voices down. So it's important to, to notice that these things may be happening and we don't notice them. Yeah. Uh, when it gets to the extremes, when we can't deal with it as a society, when it becomes that taboo thing, then it, it becomes kind of... Um, how do we intervene with this person when mm. they've been seeing it as normal? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and I think that's probably one of the most important points because where the conversation has changed in the wider society, some families, some friends, some co-workers are a lot more sensitive in detecting changes in people. Mm -hmm. But what we don't know is how to address it. Is there a wrong way to tackle the situation? Let's, let's start there. <laughs> I want to add another example, which mm -hmm. would make it like, a, would bring a lot of light into this topic. Let's say you are a casual drinker, mm -hmm. but your drinking becomes a lot more consistent. Mm -hmm. At what point does it become an addiction? And at what point do family members or friends address it? So that's the kind mm -hmm. of, I wanted to yeah. use that example so that we can see do we offend the person if we tell the person you mm -hmm. know and it's important if you have a concern this is why we're talking about the red flags right now mm -hmm. so that you can come up to the person and say you know i've noticed this change in you i've noticed that change in you and i've noticed this change in you mm -hmm. so you start the conversation there you're not accusing mm -hmm. you're not labeling mm -hmm. but you say you know, you didn't used to go out that much and now you go out a lot. Mm -hmm. What's different? And you start a conversation. Yeah. In that conversation, the person may notice that their behavior is changing. What I mentioned earlier about the depression is that sometimes we don't notice it at all. We just see it as, well, it's normal. Yeah. I just don't want to deal with that. I want to hide away from people. I just don't want to deal with whatever is overwhelming me. Mm -hmm. And so you get to that point where you're okay with your depression, you're okay with your level of thinking, but the people around you just f feel awkward around you. Mm -hmm. It's like um, my wife comes home and she shuts herself down in the room. Yeah. I can't even go into my own room and make mm -hmm. noise because she needs it quiet. And I really love her, so I want to respect her privacy, and I know that she needs that space to relax. But honestly, I haven't talked to my wife in six months. Mm -hmm. You know, we haven't had that conversation. And in a relationship, as a parent, as a spouse, as a partner, as a friend, 
Mm -hmm. you want to have that level of conversation where you can approach the person. Yeah. So when it becomes non-normative, if you prefer that term, not really <laughs> non-normative, <laughs> it, it's just outside of the norms, yeah. you know, when it becomes that, then you need to have these conversations where you can tell these people, I've noticed this. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed it? And some people might come around to it and say, yes, and I'm dealing with stuff and I don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. And you tell them, okay, I understand, but just notice that I notice these things and I'm here for you. Mm -hmm. And so you want to speak on terms that are very casual and at the level of that person. And you want to use terms where you are open to what the person has to say and you don't push the person mm -hmm. because that becomes scary to the person if you're saying i think you're an alcoholic yeah. i think you need help right <laughs> and then the person has to say but i don't think so mm -hmm. and then that conversation ends right there yeah but uh-huh no i was gonna say because i think the key part here is being able to engage in the conversation mm -hmm. when you detect behaviors. But sometimes the behaviors are dangerous, you know. Uh, perhaps it's someone who doesn't sleep at all and roams around at night. You know, you have no idea where they go. You don't know what's happening. Um, no longer showing up to work or skipping out on work halfway through the day. Behaviors that are detrimental to their health and well-being, to the health and well-being of others, and also to their own security in life if they're skipping out on work. Mm -hmm. So the behaviors are now very dangerous. Um, is it as simple as saying, I know, I, I recognize the behavior? When you notice the red flags, then you can open the conversation. Mm -hmm. When you notice these behaviors that are a danger to that person or to someone else, then you have a right to intervene mm -hmm. and you say, you are harming yourself you to the hospital or we will go to counseling yeah and that's when i see them and i have to gauge like how far do i push mm -hmm. when you see that it's beyond that red flags when you see that it's okay this person is a harm to himself or to herself or this person is a harm to someone else that is when you can see i have to do this yeah. which is why on our end we need to work with the hospitals, we have to work with the police, we have to work yeah. with the community to sensitize. Um, last week was World Mental Health Day and I think we were able to get out and, and talk to people about mental health in the workplace, how it affects people. And we were able to talk to people about how workplaces can be more sensitive to people who have these mental health needs. and. It is growing. A lot of workplaces refer clients to counselors mm -hmm. when they see that these people have verbalized suicidal ideation, when they see that the person spends half of the day crying in the bathroom, they will say, the HR manager office will say, you know, I have this employee, this person has been a really good employee mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we have noticed these changes. Mm -hmm. What should what should I do? So it shows that there is a, there's more awareness. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now some people may say that's absolutely no business of my employers whatsoever. Well, it is. If we look back at the studies, yeah. you are a member of a team, mm -hmm. and if your productivity is affecting that team, yeah. then they have a right to intervene. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have an insurance system that is as supportive, but when we do have centralized healthcare and when we do have insurance systems, it is the business of the insurance and of the government to make sure that you are getting along and getting your proper treatment as well. Okay. So those kinds of things about confidentiality and whose business is it comes up with a lot of ethical reasons. Yeah. Um, when I work with companies, we try very much to maintain confidentiality. We yeah. try very much, um, if you tell your supervisor and they tell the HR manager and they call me, they don't inform your coworkers, hey, this person is going to counseling. That yeah. is your prerogative if you want to see. If you want, you choose to schedule your appointments during work time or after work time. So mm -hmm. it really depends on the individual and the workplace. Mm -hmm. What if the intervention or the suggestions 
don't resonate with the person. So if it's a family member, if it's my sibling, and you know, I recognize the changes, you know, they perhaps are even neglecting their children because they're so depressed. Mm -hmm. And I intervene with as much sensitivity as I can and offer to talk, but nothing happens. In a particular situation with children, it's important for you to ensure that the children are not in harm. Mm -hmm. So it's on you to report. As a counselor, it is my duty to report several things. Mm -hmm. If I think that you are a harm to yourself, I have a duty to tell your support system. I have had several people who come in and they have um, suicidal ideation. And I determine, do I tell family members? Do I tell the police? Do I call the nurses? You know, mm -hmm. these are calls that I have to make as a professional. Yeah. So it is important for you, the person observing these things, mm -hmm. to make sure that it is not your role to investigate. Mm -hmm. It is not even my role as a counselor to investigate. Mm -hmm. If I hear there is a report, if someone comes in and says, I really hate my boss, I will go in tomorrow and just shoot that person, you know? Mm -hmm. I, you have to report it. I yeah. have to report it. Yeah. it because this person is stating, yeah. I will harm someone else. Yeah. And if I judge that this person really is a danger, it is my duty to report. Yeah. And similarly, if you notice that this person is a danger to him or herself, this happens a lot with, I've seen with um, high school and college and younger kids. My friend is suicidal and she told me, and I've known for it for days, but I, she told me that, you know, she trusts me. Mm -hmm. So then I'm taking on this burden and mm -hmm. I can't tell anybody else. Mm -hmm. And we have to realize that we can't protect everyone. We cannot be with that person 24 hours a day. The more people who know that this person is a danger to him or herself, the easier we will be able to live and say, okay, that person has appropriate help. Now, when, when I say that, and I know that the person is saying, but I can't tell his or her parents because the parents will just punish that person. Mm -hmm. And so we have to say, and I will say, okay, well then tell your parents mm -hmm. so that you don't have the burden on your own. Mm -hmm. um, or call the hospital, see who, what else we can do. And it's important to get more people involved. Now, I think this is a particular area that, that really is difficult because teenagers are teenagers. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, I think for some parents, when, when a teen, teen says, oh, you don't love me, I'm going to kill myself, nobody wants me, I'm going to kill myself. We don't, it doesn't always register as a as, as serious threat as perhaps it should. And where, you know, nine kids won't, one may. How does a parent respond to something like that? Especially if it's in an argument, you know, I told you you can't go out and they say, oh, well, my life sucks, I just want to die. And that's why mm -hmm. we're looking at red flags, not mm -hmm. just one flag, it's okay. not just one thing. If you know that your child has a very strong personality and often speaks out very loudly about these things, but the child still has a normal social you know, um, circle, mm -hmm. still communicates with you in a loving way and still has these things, but if on the other hand you notice that the sleeping pattern is changed completely, the person stops eating, the person has withdrawn, um, I was mentioning uh, as a part of preparing for this conversation, I was saying you have seen those kids who are at the top of their class, who are the most popular with their friends, who are in all the clubs, who are this and that. And how do you as a parent realize that this person has mental health struggles? Mm -hmm. Do you as the parent have access to that child or is that child avoiding you? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so it's important to have that, that rapport, that communication with especially a teenager to say, I'm working on where you are. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be the super closest confidant. That is not your role. Your mm -hmm. role is to know what your child is doing. Your yeah. role is to see my child is eating. My child has a normal sleep, out, sleep time. Yeah. If you see that your child is overwhelmed and is doing too much, you have to be the parent and say, 
I think you're doing too much. We yeah. have to figure out how to get your stress level down. Mm -hmm. So what about people who are high functioning in, with, with uh, their disorders, whether it's anxiety, depression, uh, you know, these are the people that just seem totally normal. And then they tell you, you know, I suffer with uh, depression or anxiety and you would never guess it. We have been talking about these people throughout this conversation. Yeah. We just talked about this high school person, but we also talked at the, about the person who comes home and crashes. Mm -hmm. And so high functioning depression isn't something that we get to talk about very often because you don't see any of the signs. Yeah. Um, these people hold on to their symptoms so closely that they don't realize they're depressed for the most part. Mm -hmm. But very often, you cannot identify high-functioning depression. Mm -hmm. It is the person who would be able to identify, you know what? I perform at 100, but my goal is always 110. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I'm a failure to myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and talking about high-functioning depression, it is you noticing the signs in yourself, mm -hmm. you noticing that even though everyone else is telling you what a good job you do, you just focus on the things that are disappointing. You realize that even though you are in, in clubs, you go to meetings, you are involved in all of these things, you still don't feel satisfied and there is that underlying depression. There is that wondering of like, what do you want to pursue? What do I want with my life? Am I feeling... Mm -hmm. um, purposeful am i feeling com content and very often these people are not um there isn't a withdrawal per se because they're still involved in everything that they do mm -hmm. but there is that shutdown that happens where once you shut down it's just hard to get back out of it yeah now i, I want to take a moment to talk about anxiety because i know and, and you perhaps you can tell me from your own practice uh, but we hear from physicians, we hear from the mental health uh, professionals that anxiety is something that we hear uh, people being diagnosed with fairly often, from very young to much older. What exactly is it? Anxiety is a normal thing in our lives. Yeah. Um, we all feel nervous. We all have these things that are barriers to stopping ourselves. You know, that gut feeling that you just feel something is wrong and something is holding you back, that stage fright that keeps you from going all in on something, that hesitation, it's a normal part in our lives. So we have to recognize that anxiety is something that mm -hmm. everyone copes with. But then it becomes dysfunctional or, or beyond our control when it starts affecting our day-to-day -day life when you start avoiding things because it's just too overwhelming to do. Mm -hmm. So you can notice in the different areas of your life, am I avoiding things? Am I just not engaging because I'm scared? Am I not feeling fulfilled mm -hmm. because it's just too much anxiety? Mm -hmm. So you know what your normal level of nervousness is, but when it pushes to the point where your productivity struggles, where your interaction and your social um, support kind of crumbles because of that anxiety, then it becomes an issue. Mm -hmm. But again, I always go back to saying anxiety is normal. It's normal. Yeah. And we can, we can have other things to cope with this. We can be a lot more organized. Mm -hmm. That helps a lot with anxiety. We can... Um, try to spread out the things that we have to do during the day. We can, organ um, I go back to organization because organization helps a lot with anxiety. Yeah. Once we are prepared and we know what is coming, we can be a lot more ready for it. And mm -hmm. so if I know that I have to come on here at, at 6.30 at seven in the morning, mm -hmm. I make sure that I sleep okay so that when I come here, I don't like, um, I don't have the pressure of, of worrying and yeah. things like that. And so it's important for you to know how comfortable you are with something and to make sure that things are in place so that you are okay starting it. Yeah. Now, on, on the flip side of that, we're also, uh, we're all patients of Dr. Google. Oh. And I think a lot of people... Uh, tend to self-diagnose issues and not just mental health issues but also even even physical conditions the physicians will tell you the same if you talk to them 
Um, while I think, I mean, what's your perspective on this? So it seems that especially the younger generation will tell you they have X, Y, and Z so openly um, without a proper diagnosis. What's, what's the pros and cons of this This I've phenomenon? always been a fan of that because I'm a little bit of a hypochondriac myself. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's important to know that labels can be scarring. Mm -hmm. So we can't go around labeling other people OCD. We can't go around <laughs> saying, you know, you're autistic, you're yeah. retarded. You know, mental retardation is an actual diagnosis. Yeah. It, but a lot of these words have been taken into our regular vocabulary and the meaning has been taken away. A lot of people come in and say, you know, I'm bipolar. And I start listing, so do you have this, 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 and that? And they're like, no, my mood changes like three or 20 times a day. I'm like, that's not bipolar disorder. <laughs> and so one thing that is important is to make sure that if you do see the signs in yourself, you can go ahead and Google it and see, okay, I do meet these criteria, but don't diagnose yourself and take on the label. The yeah. most labels I say you should take on are like introverted and extroverted. <laughs> but a lot of these labels, um, a lot of parents will come in and say, um, my, the teacher said my child has ADHD. I don't know what that is. Yep. And sometimes the, the kids do have two or three signs of it, but they don't meet full criteria. And so it's just working on those things. So if you notice that you have criteria for something, then your next job on Google is to see how to treat and how to start working on those things. So one of the things- With behavioral changes, not medication, yeah. <laughs> Well, oh, yeah. <laughs> hope, no, medication, no. Yeah. I, I can't, I don't prescribe. So it's okay. something that I would always work in a team yeah. with someone else. And so I don't really think about medications. But, you know, in Belize, we all prescribe. We all need our Xanax to go to sleep. We all, mm -hmm. need, you know, we all need our coffee in the morning. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh -huh. so we do have this societal expectation of if you know what's broken, then I know what fixes it. Yeah. Um, it's important not to go too overboard with it. Like I said, make sure you have a healthy relationship with what you think it is. But if you can work on the things that you see is wrong and you can center yourself a little bit with that guidance, yeah. then that's what the role of Dr. Google is. Mm -hmm. It's not to say I have autism and I don't understand the world. It's just, you know what? Sometimes when I interact with coworkers, I really don't understand where they're coming from. So yeah. maybe I, I do fall a little bit, I, I do have some criteria from the autism spectrum, but... Or maybe you just have the wrong coworkers. <laughs> <laughs> See, now you're pushing, you're pushing <laughs> labels <laughs> out there. But, uh, you know, I think because, like I said, there are pros and cons to everything and mm -hmm. access to information is you know, uh, one of the greatest benefits of our time. Yes. Um, but it's also, you know, I've heard parents say exactly what you say. My child has X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. and then you ask if they've ever gotten diagnosed. If their children have been diagnosed, then they haven't. Mm -hmm. um, so these children are growing up thinking something is wrong with me or I'm different, um, but they haven't really been checked as yet. What we hear I, anxiety being thrown about What I lot. like to say is if we look back at our society 20 years ago, would this be a normative behavior or would it be not normative? Well, it seems more <laughs> normative now. I think people are more accustomed to the fact that one, children learn differently. Sometimes mm -hmm. children have difficulties in learning in the standard system that we've set up. Um, but I don't know how many of our teachers have tools to be able to help them. And I don't know how many of these children have actually been uh, assessed to know what uh, particular challenges they may have. That is something that we are developing. There yeah. are a lot more children now in the school system in Belize who have been diagnosed mm -hmm. and who whose parents are a lot more supportive. Yeah. Rather than being the rude child in the yeah. class, we understand that if you put this child at the front of the classroom, yeah. And if you give this child extra work, the, the child will not distract the class and the child will do this. Yeah. And you Once know, upon a time, they used to put you in the back so you don't distract <laughs> anyone else. <laughs> Actually, I think a lot of the teachers used to do that intuitively. Okay, mm -hmm. you, are, you, are my, um, you are the one who is always busy. Let me make you busy. Yeah. And so the teacher would send that child on errands, would do this. Yeah. 
and that way keep the child doing something productive all day long. So what do you, what, what's our final point in terms of uh, talking to the wider public about, now we're not going to go around and diagnose based on this conversation, but what is the one thing we can all do to become better advocates for uh, mental health? No, notice changes. Yeah. Be more aware. I think that's the takeaway. Be more aware in yourself, be insightful, but always be aware of what is going on with your coworkers. Mm -hmm. And also don't be afraid to communicate. Mm -hmm. That is one of the biggest barriers that we have, the biggest taboo that we have. Just getting someone to call me mm -hmm. is a big deal. Uh, people call and they say, you know, I've been considering this for months. I just haven't had, you know, mm -hmm. I just haven't had the chance or I just, you know, haven't had the opportunity or, I want to do it, but I just didn't think I was ready. Yeah. And so getting to that level where you say, let me talk to someone yeah. is important. So be aware in yourself, in other people, what is different mm -hmm. in their personality, what is changed in them, and also reach out and communicate. Yeah. And uh, of course, there are private uh, counselors available like yourself, mm -hmm. but there are also uh, counselors available at uh, the public health clinics across the country yes for with uh and they will be able to see you for free yes. so we always remind people of that just go to your public clinic and ask if you can speak to someone uh you're having concerns with your mental health and you will be directed thank you so much for being here we appreciate you coming in and sharing this very important information thank you have a great day all right we're gonna go ahead and take a break and when we come back we're gonna be focusing on world food days thank you